Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome to Let's Go Atari Jaguar, a new series on, well, on the Atari Jaguar. It's fair to say that the Atari Jaguar is not one of the most beloved consoles in the world. Back on its original release, it was criticised for a variety of reasons, and today there are still many people who look back on it as a bit of a joke. But I've always been rather fond of it. I've been an Atari boy since the day I was born, after all, and so I wasn't going to miss out on experiencing the company's last hurrah in the gaming hardware market. That said, I never owned my own Jaguar back in the day. At some point in 1994, my brother, who was working in the UK Games Press at the time, came into possession of one, and he was good enough to lend it to me for a bit. I suspect he didn't think all that much of it. There was an opportunity there for me, though, Prior to this point, I'd been occasionally contributing to the UK Atari magazine New Atari User, formerly known as Page 6, and no one there had covered the Jaguar. And so it was that my friend Mike and I, with a little assistance from my dad since I was just 13 at the time, decided to write a feature-length review, which was subsequently published in the October-November 1994 issue of New Atari User, issue number 68. That issue along with most of the rest of the run of Page 6 and new Atari user, is archived over at Atari Mania. Our feelings about the Jaguar at the time were pretty positive, though we knew in our hearts with Atari's previous track record that they would almost certainly make a mess of both promoting the new machine and attracting enough developers to support it. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Something curious happened though. I must admit I haven't looked deeply enough into the scene to really understand exactly how or why it happened, but it seems that over the years an incredibly passionate worldwide band of dedicated Jaguar enthusiasts has formed. It's a community which accepts that the system has flaws, and that Atari made a bit of a mess of it, but one that also enjoys what it offers. Not only that, but certain parts of that community are even continuing to make new games and demos for it as well as supporting it with hardware devices such as flashcards. The Jaguar remains the nichest of niche interest consoles to this day, and I certainly wouldn't recommend that anyone rush out and buy one without understanding what they're getting into. If you're curious, I'd recommend your first stop be Atari 50, the anniversary celebration for modern platforms, which includes a selection of Jaguar games in its playable library. But the Atari Jaguar is a system that, for me and many other people out there, has an undeniable charm about it, jank and all. And so I think it's high time we started celebrating it around here. And what better place to start than with a title that is commonly regarded to be among the system's very worst games. I give you Club Drive from 1994. Club Drive was one of the first games announced for the Jaguar, and was developed by a lot of the same staff who worked on Alien vs Predator commonly regarded as one of the system's best games. The game was originally intended to have an online multiplayer, thanks to the device known as the Jaguar Voice Modem, but since this peripheral was never completed, Club Drive shipped with only a split-screen two-player mode, and of course can be played solo. Club Drive is set in the year 2098, when driving has been legalised once again after a period when it had been banned due to safety concerns. To celebrate the revival of driving and the invention of indestructible vehicles, an amusement park named Club Drive has been created, and you're paying it a visit. It's a ridiculous premise, but this is very much a silly game about just enjoying yourself rather than anything intended to be taken seriously. Like many other Jaguar games, you can trace a pretty direct line from Club Drive all the way back to classic arcade-style games for the Atari 2600, in this case Indy 500, also known simply as Race. And when you consider it in that light, there's actually a lot of fun to be had. A lot of people over the years haven't felt that way, however. Writing on his Digitizer 2000 blog in 2017, Paul Mr Biffo Rose recalls feeling sympathy for Atari UK's head of Jaguar marketing, Daryl Still, because he clearly hadn't been provided with any budget to help make the machine a success, and everything seemed stacked against him. The worst of still suffering, Biffo recalls, was at a presentation hosted by Atari at the London Planetarium, part of a quasi-relaunch of the Jaguar system. During that presentation, the assembled games press, heavily intoxicated as a result of the open bar, greeted the showreel of upcoming Jaguar games with jeers and catcalls, 
when Club Drive finally came on screen, this escalated to outright laughter. Our mood on the way out was despondent, low, Biffo recalls. We bumped into a distraught and furious Daryl Still, who was fuming from the audience's response. We tried to calm him down and mentioned that their opinion was sure to change once Club Drive was finished. But it is finished, he squeaked, the desperation in his voice impossible to ignore. That's the finished game. I didn't play Club Drive back in the day. I gave it a go for the first time quite recently as part of the Atari 50 collection. And having heard so much negativity about it over the years from a variety of sources, I was prepared for a miserable experience. I was surprised to discover a game that I actually rather like. It's not one I'm going to unreservedly recommend or anything, but it is one that I feel has a certain charm to it in the tradition of classic Atari games that date right back to the late 70s. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a tour now to show you what it's all about, warts and all. Let's go play Club Drive. Okay, here we are with Club Drive for Atari Jaguar, supposedly one of the worst video games ever created. Um, but you know me, I don't put much stock in opinions like that. I enjoyed Sonic 06 and I'm not afraid to admit it. Um, and so I've actually found a few things to like about Club Drive. Yes, it's got a lot of problems, design issues, um, and it is of course not a patch on um, pretty much any other racing game. But there's some value here. I don't think it's the worst video game ever created. Um, in my own personal rankings, that honor still goes to Sword Quest Fireworld, which is one of the most offensively bad video games I've ever had the misfortune of playing, but uh, I'll leave you to um, to explore that for yourself. Anyway, so we have a bunch of different ways we can play Club Drive. Uh, you have all these game modes here. So we have Collect for one or two players, which puts you in a sort of arena environment and you have to collect power balls. It's a bit like the crash and score mode in Indy 500 on the 2600. Um, there's racing, where you basically race from one end of a map to the other and then back again. Although you can increase the number of laps uh, if you want. Um, the racing is quite interesting because there's no set route. You've just got two checkpoints. So it's kind of up to you to determine what you think the best route is. Uh, and then there's tag, which you can only play in two player. Uh, so we won't be doing that today. But again, that's something that's straight out of Indy 500. Right, we'll start with a collect game uh, with 10 power balls. Uh, you have a selection of different worlds that you can choose from. So there's four altogether. There's actually a fifth secret one as well. We'll, we'll um, see if we can trigger that a little bit later on. Let's go to Jerome's pad first of all. This is probably the most iconic uh, one in the game. It's the one where you're driving tiny toy cars around a, um, a house, which is a bit of fun. Uh, and then your car here, only difference there as far as I'm aware is color. So let's go for the blue one. Let's check the options. Uh, keep the engines on, we'll keep this speed on slow for the minute. And then start. Collect the power balls. So it's those weird sort of psychedelic things that you've got there. So you dumped on the floor and you're then invited to go and find the power balls. So you see we've got pretty much entirely flat shaded polygons here. Um, there are a few textures here and there, like you can see up on the window up there, there's a, there's a texture map on there to simulate the outside view, uh, but it's quite low resolution and bendy. Here we are driving up the ramp onto the table. And uh, power ball's not here, so I guess it's under the table. So we'll just fall off. And your car auto writes itself when you uh, when you fall off things, so you don't need to sort of reset or anything like that. There it is. All right. uh, and there's one right there. All right. And then one near the ramp. There it is. So there are different views you can use as well. I believe you use the number pad to get to those. There we are. Okay, so there's an external view. Actually, that's a front view, isn't it? Yeah. 
This one's quite fun. It's a... Oh, that's front view again, isn't it? Oh, no, that's that's the one I was thinking of. This is this is a fun sort of remote control style view. Um, you're not in the best position for the camera to show this off, really. Hence all the juddering. Where are we? There we go. Okay, now this one's the chase view. That's the remote control view. All right. So you can only use this view in the um, in the Powerball mode that we're playing here, I think. But I think when you're playing this mode, this view actually works really nicely. It's actually pretty fun to play from this view. And you'll see when you get far enough away, it should shift the camera angle. It also gives you a chance to get a better look at what's going on in the scenery around the place. So you can see they're playing Pong on the television. So, like I say, I mean, I understand entirely why people look at this and think it's terrible. Um, because it sort of is. But also, I like it. It's just fun. I really like the concept. I think it's a bit of silly fun that if you don't take too, too seriously, it's perfectly enjoyable. I think part of my reason for feeling that way, and part of my reason for being a lot more accepting of the Jaguar in general than a lot of people, is that the games on the Jaguar remind me not of console games, but of home computer games. So, like, this game feels like something that I would have played on a souped-up Atari ST. So, it's, it's got that sort of home computer game clunkiness about it. Which I fully appreciate not everyone is into, not everyone likes. But I do, and a lot of other people out there do as well. So I feel there's, there's a definite charm to Jaguar games in general that is very strongly reminiscent... Oops. That's hard to line up from that angle, isn't it? It's very strongly reminiscent of 16-bit home computer games. Oh dear. Maybe we go back to the normal view for this one. Settle down. Yeah, and I think that was part of, part of the problem with the Jaguar. Is that... It was released as a games console. And as such, people thought that it was going to... Compete. With the Super NES, the Mega Drive, the PC Engine. And then subsequently the PlayStation and the Saturn. Compared to pretty much any of those machines, the Jaguar fails miserably. Because its 2D games are decent enough, but often they don't run as smoothly as um, the Mega Drive and Super NES versions. 3D stuff obviously looks pretty simplistic compared to uh, PlayStation and Saturn stuff. And yeah. So, obviously, in that regard, it, it doesn't compete with those systems at all. Um, and I'm hesitant to say that it, it's not supposed to compete with those systems. Let's, um, let's switch to another game mode while I carry on talking. I hesitate to say that it wasn't supposed to compete with those systems. But it certainly feels like it was designed more like a home computer in terms of its capabilities than an actual games console. Which means that a lot of its capabilities, or lack thereof, feel very similar to things that you would have... Oh no, I didn't mean to start the same game again. Oh well, never mind. Let's, let, let's, let's, let's play again, because why not? And let's play from the remote control view again. So like I say, if, if, 
if I'd played this game on Atari ST, I would have really enjoyed it. I think if I'd owned this on Jaguar back in the day, to be honest, I'd have enjoyed it. Where's the thing? <laughs> that is one thing I, I, I do really like about this game is that there's lots of silly little touches in it, like crashing into the toilet and it flushing. And you'll see when we come onto some of the other stages, there's a lot of other silliness going on as well. But yeah, like like I say, I think I think if you're interested in exploring the Atari Jaguar, it's worth going in with the appropriate expectations. And I'm talking about the appropriate expectations in 2022, not what were the expectations for the system when it originally came out in the 90s, because those are, those are clearly wrong. But if you're going to the Jaguar with the expectation that you're going to be playing with a system that is akin to a consoleized version of a home computer, I think you'll have a much better time. And in fact, there's considerable precedent for Atari doing that, because back in the 80s, they released the Atari 5200, uh, which was essentially a consoleized. Oh dear. I can't really do that ramp from the remote control view, can we? So let's, let's go back to first person. Yeah, the 5200 was a consoleized. Atari 8-bit, uh, albeit with cartridges that were not compatible. Um, the XE game system was sort of positioned as a console, but it, it was it was just a, a 65 XE. So that literally was an Atari 8-bit computer with a detachable keyboard. Um, and throughout the Atari ST era, there was considerable I don't know if I want to call it demand, but there were a lot of calls for Atari to do um, a home console based on the Atari ST. Right. <clears throat> I don't really know why, um, because the ST existed and was absolutely fine. Um, but at the same time, the ST was also noticeably inferior in terms of technological capabilities to um, other dedicated games machines that were around at the time. So other 16-bit consoles like the Mega Drive and the uh, the Super NES, they, out they consistently outperformed the ST. And so I think if an Atari ST console had happened Oh, we're getting very lucky with these. I think if, if an Atari ST console had materialized, it would have been in exactly the same position as the Jaguar, where people would have had unreasonable expectations of what it would offer and then be disappointed when it didn't live up to those expectations. Right. And in many ways, I feel like the Jaguar is is almost the ST console that we never got. Right, let's do something different. Let's do a race. And let's go to San Francisco. Uh, we'll keep on the slow cars for now. Yeah, like, like I say, in many respects, I feel like the Jaguar is the Atari ST console that we never got. Yes, the Jaguar is more capable than the Atari ST. It's it's closer to it's closer to what the Falcon did. Um, so I guess you, I guess you could call it an Atari Falcon console. I don't know a ton about the Falcon. Um, but I do know that there are similarities between it and the Jaguar. Uh, 
So, like I say, in these race modes, you have two checkpoints that you need to get between. But it's up to you exactly how you get from one to the other. And you'll need to figure out the best route between them for yourselves. So here we are driving around San Francisco. There's a cable car. Get out the way! See, around the time this would have come out, I was quite hungry for an experience like this. Because although racing games like Ridge Racer and such like are obviously a lot more impressive from a visual perspective and a lot more playable, one thing I really wanted from driving games was a sort of open environment to explore. And while this game isn't completely open world or anything like that, it does feel open enough that there is stuff to explore. There's different routes to find. There's even some little Easter eggs hidden around the place as well, which we'll, we'll try and track down. One of our little excursions. So, like I say, at, at the time this came out, having a little well to drive around in a in a toy car, I would have enjoyed that. And it kind of saddened me to read um, Biffo's words about the press conference that Atari hosted, because I can I can absolutely picture that happening. And I feel like it was, I feel like it's quite a uniquely UK games press thing that that happened. Because the UK games press has always had a sort of abrasive edge to it. Um, and that, that kind of persists to this day, not quite as much as it used to be. But it's, it's still there, and, and on the few occasions when I've been to live events where UK games journalists were, yeah, I, c I can absolutely picture an audience of UK games journalists getting absolutely off their tits drunk and being incredibly rude about a presentation that they were seeing. I mean, sure. If you saw if you saw Atari showreel of Jaguar stuff and you didn't think much of it, fine. But you you don't you don't jeer and catcall and you don't laugh, do you? I wouldn't. Like I I would I would save that reaction for a scathing write up in the magazine. When yes, it would likely still upset some people who worked on the project that you're criticising. But you're not... You're not being unpleasant to someone who's actually there. Like, I, I feel so bad for that poor guy, Daryl Steele. And it's clear that Biffo did as well. Like if if I'd been at that event, that would not be a fond memory. That would be a tremendously awkward memory that I would I would try my best to forget, to be perfectly honest. And all over a game that I don't think is actually that bad. Like I say, there are plenty of criticisms you can level at this game. The fact that there's no sort of 
there's no sort of single player progression there's all there is to do in this is the races and the the powerball and if if you can convince someone to play it and to play with you um the tag mode so there's there's nothing to unlock the only sort of replay incentive is to get better times but again that's perfectly in keeping with whoops Oh, here we go. Here's a, here's a cool thing. If you hold down the option button on the Jaguar, there's a rewind function. So like that, that's still relatively infrequently seen in racing games today. It's used in like um, Forza Horizon. It uses a rewind function, but that had never been seen before. So that's a really cool little feature. So yeah, like I said, the main problem with this game is that there's not necessarily anything to keep you playing in the long term. Which is a bit of a problem for games released today. But when you compare it to other stuff that was released on the Jaguar at the time, not unusual. Especially for Atari. Atari had always, always released arcade style games. Games that were designed to be sat down with, enjoyed for a single session, and then set aside. And there's very much a time and place for that sort of thing. A game that doesn't demand anything of you, doesn't demand any commitment. All you have to do is just sit and play. Sit and enjoy it. <clears throat> and that's basically what this game offers. So, like, this game is not sort of me demonstrating any great skill or anything like that. It's not... It's not, it's not sort of really putting me through my paces as a game or anything like that, but it's a game to just chill out with. It's absolutely fine. So there we go, that's a race event. Rank Ace. That's another thing that reminds me of old Atari arcade games. It reminds me a bit of uh, like the really early racing games like Superbug, and Fire Truck, and that sort of thing. And the best time for me there. All right, let's see if we can find a couple of these Easter eggs. So, I believe if we do a race on Jerome's pad, uh, I think you have to set the cars to fast as well. And then I think you have to drive through the fireplace. Right, apparently not. <laughs> Maybe we need to, like, a faster run up or something. All right, let's get a run up from here, see if we can smash through. But I suspect we're probably just going to flip out on the, the lip in front of it. Oh no, there we go. There it is. That's the castle from Adventure. <laughs> Excuse my wife sneezing, if you heard that. And again, it is very much cold season around here. But yeah, there we go. A castle from Adventure and then a glowy blue square. Let's see what this does. It takes us back into the room. That's what it does. Thump. And you'll see the TV screen is actually displaying what we're doing, which is cool. Anyway, let's head on over here. Head for that checkpoint. There's a block of cheese. There is a mouse that will occasionally come and grab that. An endearingly low polygon mouse. There's the checkpoint. Right. 
and then we just need to there's the mouse there's a cat somewhere as well and the cat will of course chase the mouse Let's see if we can find the cat See, this, this is part of the fun of this game. Is is not necessarily playing it, but just looking around and finding all the fun little things you can do. Where is the cat? I think I've made a terrible mistake somewhere. I think we're in the toilet. There's a piano. There's the fireplace again. We're back we're back near the start somewhere, I think. There's the start line. Alright. So that's the adventure Easter egg. Rank Cappy. And then I believe, I believe there's also a thing like that on the Wild West stage as well. So if we go to World, Old West, not Wild West. So in this one, there's like a cave sequence. And somewhere in the midst of that, there's like a flashing wall we can find, I think. Yeah, we can't do the remote control view in uh, in race games, unfortunately, which is a shame. I think it would have been quite fun to, to do a whole race from that sort of remote control view. It would have given it quite a distinctive feel. This level is a little bit fiddly and glitchy because I, I think it's supposed to be simulating the, like the the road surface being bumpy. Um, it doesn't do it brilliantly. It just sort of seems to do it by sort of randomly flicking your car up and down sometimes. Oh, there we go. I'm gonna go that way, I think. Yeah, there we go. So you see, we, we've got that mini map down at the bottom of the screen. And there's the blue arrow showing us, whoops, showing us which direction we're going as well. So if you do get disoriented at any point, you can, you can use that to help guide where you should be going. And so with flat shaded scenery like this, it, it is quite easy to, uh, to lose track of where you are and where you're supposed to be going. Oops. All right, is that cave over there we want to go into? Let's have a look. So one of these caves has apparently got a like a glowing square on the wall, a bit like the one we saw in the adventure castle. So that's what we're looking for. I don't know where this one is. So it might take a little bit of hunting around, but I'm sure we'll find it. Not this way, because that's just back outside again. So let's go all the way across the map to the other side. Oh, hold on, what was that? Is 
it is. Ooh, something's happened. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is this is the dinosaur bit. Forgotten about that one. I think that oh. There's a discarded rocket and or missile here. Does the dinosaur do anything if we crash into it? No, sadly. We just drive across the water. Oh, that takes us right back to the start. Jesus. Right. So I guess, I guess you can use that as a nice shortcut on the way back. But don't stumble into it on the way. All right, so that's one thing. But there's, there's another thing on this track somewhere, apparently. Let's see if we can track it down. Let's try going this way this time, heading off to the right. Again, we want to go into that mine shaft that we were in before. Uh, so let's try staying down here. A hill with some gravestones on it. And it looks like the mine shaft entrance is actually up top instead of down here. Never mind. plant there. Right, there it is. So up the hill. And into here. It should be somewhere in here, I guess. Keep an eye out on both sides. Oh, there it is. So now, we should be, there we are, it's Atari Headquarters. Can we drive through the door? No. Can we get back from here? More to the point. <laughs> Oh, this one sets you to the the far end. So you can use this one as a shortcut to the uh, the finish line. I say shortcut, we took ages finding it, didn't we? <laughs> All right, well, let's see if we can use the uh, the dinosaur shortcut on the way back. and negotiate this bit of bumpy road first. Oops. See, see that, that's what I mean by the, the, the questionable simulation of the, of the bumpy road there is if you go too fast, it will just send you flying. Which is a little bit annoying, but you know, deal with it. <laughs> I think we can get into the mine from here. Yes. So we want to head down here and look for the odd colored wall there. And then drive past the dinosaur. Drive under the dinosaur. And through the thing. And hit the checkpoint. There we go. Slowpoke. Yeah. Well, we were exploring.
Right, one thing I do want to try, uh, because I, I've not actually tried it myself before, um, is there's, there's a secret level apparently, which you can access by going to the world select menu and then pressing four and two on the Jaguar control pad. There we are, Planet Todd. I don't believe you can access that in the Atari 50 version, which is a bit of a shame. Um, because there's no means of actually directly accessing the keypad. It's got a radial menu. Uh, it's got a radial menu to just access all, all of the functions that you would normally be able to access with the with the keypad. Which is great for convenience. It's a lot more convenient than the actual keypad. Um, but it does mean you can't do things like button combinations. So I'm not sure what the deal is with this level, but yes, it's it's a secret level. Whee! Oh dear. There you go. You see, auto rewind if you uh, if you get yourself into a a situation you can't escape from. All right. Well, there's the there's the checkpoint, I guess. Now, how do we get back from here? Jump? Oh, that's what that's for. Well, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? I don't remember where the start line was. <laughs> All right, we drove out through there. We didn't go up or down there. So I guess it's back this way. Yeah, I remember going through these rocks. I remember going past that yellow thing. I think it's around here. There it is. Ace. All right, so one last thing today. Let's do a race on the, the fourth world that we haven't seen yet. Uh, which is this one. Velocity Park. Well, this one's an actual circuit. Okay. One quite interesting thing about this is that the... Oh, dear. Didn't like going up that hill fast, did you? Um, one quite interesting thing about um, the different worlds in this is that the, the map is different from the race mode to the um, to the Powerball mode. So the Powerball mode map is designed to be um, sort of like a, an open environment. There's no sort of checkpoints in, you just sort of drive around. It's a bit like an arena. Whereas the raceway tracks are designed to have sort of set routes through them. In the case of the San Francisco and the Old West ones, and the and Jerome's pad to an extent, I think as well, um, you have a choice of routes. Because this this one is designed to be a bit more of a traditional circuit, from the look of things. So they're just sort of the sort of dodgy, bumpy road handling on this means that you have to drive quite cautiously on this rather than really flooring it which I guess is fine because it means you need to slow down for corners and such like it is a little bit frustrating when something like that happens so it doesn't really feel like it was your fault <coughs> <coughs> oh excuse me
Oh dear, what's happened there? I fell off. I guess that's supposed to be a jump then. Okay, so this will be our supposed to go flying off. All right, full power. And up. There we go. Right, there's the checkpoint. Now, unlike the other course, you don't need to just reverse direction in this one. You just keep going around the course and you'll eventually reach the other checkpoint. That's it. Kind of a strange way of doing things, but, you know, it works, so. So when it says two laps, it actually means two checkpoints. Pizza guy. All right, so that that is Club Drive. That's most of what that game has to offer. So I say the the longevity for it is supposed to come from trying to improve your times and such like, and perhaps the two player mode. Um. So yeah, in some regards, it is a bit limited. Absolutely, um, I completely understand that. But I, the worst video game of all time? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, this is one of those occasions where you have to sort of take it on its on its own rather than comparing to other stuff that was around at the same time or indeed anything else. But if you if you take this on its own merits, of which there are some, it's an inoffensive enough game, I think. Like I say, it's not a game that I'm going to rush out and recommend and shout from the rooftops that everyone should play club drive from 1994 but equally i'm not going to sit here and say this is the worst game ever you must avoid it at all cost you must laugh at it because i i don't think that's fair to it i think it's a it's a bit of a shame how people have reacted to this and the jaguar as a whole over the years and so basically that's what this series is all about. We're going to explore some entries from the Jaguar's library. I haven't called this Atari Jaguar A to Z because I just want to, I just want to sort of pick and choose from week to week rather than uh, using an A to Z gimmick. Um, but eventually, yeah, I'd like to go through all of, the, all of the commercial releases for the Jaguar. Some of the homebrew releases um, that I can get running. Um, I've got a Jaguar game driver that's got pretty much the complete library on it, um, including some of the CD games. Some of those are a bit flaky um, running from the game drive though, so um, I'll try and get those running because it would be good to explore those too, but some, some of those just don't work um, without real hardware. Um, and while I do have a real Atari Jaguar, which is what we're playing this on, um, I do not have the money to spend on a real Atari Jaguar CD unit, sadly. <laughs> so if anyone wants to donate one, I will gladly take it off your hands. Um, but I do not have the money to buy one for myself, sadly. So any CD stuff uh, we do will have to be stuff that works with the game drive, um, which is, like I say, some of it, not all of it, some of it. But yeah, please look forward to that. This isn't going to be, so like most of my stuff on my channel, this isn't going to be like regular every week or anything like that, but it's uh, it's something we'll, we'll revisit periodically and have a bit of fun with, so. I hope you enjoy taking this journey with me. Just remains for me to say, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time.